If just one question could immediately transform the quality of your life or the results of your business, would you want to know what that question was? Life and business strategist Kevin Bees interviews success masters to discover their life-changing questions. Welcome to the Life-Changing Questions Podcast. Welcome to episode number 248 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today we have Mark Mulwiney. He is a lifelong entrepreneur who has been helping coaches get more clients without paid ads since 2014. He is the host of the Natural Born Coaches podcast, which is coming close to 900 episodes released. And he's a Tarzan of the Coaching Jungle Facebook group, which has over 25,000 coaches. He's been a speaker at events like Social Media Marketing World, and he frequently makes media appearances and has contributed for organizations like Entrepreneur.com. Com. Mark, I am so uh, so excited to have you here today. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. So congratulations. I hear you are just celebrating the ninth birthday of uh, of the Coaching Jungle. Yeah, it's off to elementary school. Well, I guess I would have been when it's six or so. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, today actually was uh, Facebook prompted me. I didn't even realize it's like, hey, today's a nine-year birthday or anniversary of the Coaching Jungle Facebook group. So yes, time flies. Incredible. And what success you have in because very few podcasters, I think the statistic is like less than 1% of podcasters ever get over 100 episodes. And here you are at 900 episodes. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How have you been able to be so consistent over such a long period of time with this? So whenever I do something, I tend to not overthink it. I just jump into the pool, so to speak. So when I decide to launch Natural Born Coaches, it launched November of 2014 naive me thought I'll do a daily show <laughs> and you know how much work podcasting can be. So for the first year it was a daily show. And then I said, you know, maybe this isn't the right frequency or whatever, but it's been a weekly frequency for years. But that's one of the reasons if anyone's doing the math and say, wait a minute, if the show's roughly nine years old and whatever, that's why I guess with, or 10, almost 10 years old now, whenever I decide to do something too, I don't get too hung up in the results right away. I find a lot of people think, okay, I'll do this, but then they do something for a couple of weeks or a month and they don't get any clients. It's like, oh, okay, well, this doesn't work. I'll run off to do some other bright, shiny object. And I always view it that I'm just going to do my best possible job with this not going to care about the results. Obviously, I want to uh, have an ROI with it, but I'm just going to focus on the quality of it and learn as we get going. And then it's a compound effect. Now it's like brushing my teeth. You know, I couldn't not podcast even if I tried. I love it. It's built into your habits and uh, it's just part of what you do, which is wonderful. Tell us out of 900 episodes, what's been maybe the biggest insight or the biggest takeaway or, you know, as you look back now, the biggest lesson that you've gotten from this journey? It's that nobody has everything figured out, you know, in the online space, social media, it's, it's easy to feel dejected because you look at everyone else sharing their wins and you know how much BS is out there. Not saying everyone's full of it, but there is a lot of um, embellishment going on. You could say uh, from speaking with people on the podcast and having chats after we're done recording and stuff, they're very open about their struggles. You know, I've heard, a lot of stories about, uh, you know, like burnout and bankruptcies, terrible things happening, but they just kept going. And you look at them now and you think, wow, they've got it all figured out. So I think that would be the biggest thing or one of the biggest that I would take from it is that nobody is perfect, you know, and that takes some pressure off us because perfectionism, I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with that. Yeah, such a, a really important message. You know, nobody has everything figured out. And it is it really levels a playing field when you realize that. And I know I've worked with some very senior leaders and senior executives, and, and you would believe that they've got everything together. But when you get up close, they have the same fears, the same doubts, the same concerns as everyone else. But I think you really hit the nail on the head there, Mark, when you say they, they kind of kept going, you know, whether it was burnout or bankruptcy or some other block or obstacle in the way, they, they've kept going, they persisted. And I love your energy around, hey, my objective wasn't to just do this thing for a few days or a few weeks. It's like, I'm going to do this and do the best job I've got at it. And results will come eventually. Uh, now, with 900 episodes in and over 25,000 coaches in your community, there's a lot of people listening with interest about how did you grow your community to be that size? I had a nice head start. So um, to make a really long story short, when I had launched a podcast, I had a Facebook group for past guests of the show. It had a really original name, Natural Born Coaches Past Guest <laughs> for the group. 
And um, so I had a few hundred people in there in that first year. Uh, but what was happening was a lot of people were requesting to join the group, not noticing the past guest part or whatever. And I would have a standard message that I would send them like, hey, thanks for requesting to join. However, this is only for people who have been on my podcast, you know, have a nice life. And after enough of that, I thought, hmm, maybe I should have a group that's open to more people, not just past guests of my show. And that's where the coaching jungle was born. And I shot down the Facebook group that was for the podcast guests, but I invited them into the coaching jungle. So I had my first 500 or so pretty quick between a couple hundred that were in the past guest group and then getting the word out. I'd say my first thousand we did got pretty quickly because I had my name out there, some with the podcast and everything else too. And I found that was a tipping point. Once we got up over a thousand, Facebook seemed to be suggesting the group to more people on Facebook. And then it's just, I still promote it. You know, any interviews I do, I talk about the group and I'm still putting the word out there, but it, it really has been growing organically uh, quite a bit. I love that. That's uh, so good. And I never even thought about having a group for my past podcast guests. There'd be, yeah, that'd be a really powerful group. There's been some really interesting people on there. Now it's kind of grown, you say organically, but you're out there, you're speaking, you're talking, you're, you know, you're letting people know about it. Is one thing getting people into the group, I guess there's another thing keeping them engaged so that they stick around. So what's your secret sauce there, Mark? Well, it starts with the group owner. If you're not active in your own group, why should anyone else be? So since the birth of the coaching jungle, I've posted multiple times a day in the group. Now we have other things like the regular theme days and stuff like that. But I try to make efforts too with if someone has a question, they post on the wall and I'm going through my mental Rolodex because I know someone that can answer it if I can't and I'm tagging them and I'm getting them into the conversation as well. Uh, we've done contests like draws for certain things. You know, with Facebook groups, it could be hit or miss. You know, I think that there has been lowering of engagement across the board in Facebook groups the last few years, just speaking with a lot of group owners. But we seem to have mostly bucked the trend for the jungle, you know, um, with it just by doing some of those things that I mentioned. And it's a real challenge, you know, for I've got clients who work groups similar size to you, and they've also noticed this less interaction, less kind of promotion of their, you know, the material, you know, in the past, they would have had, you know, tens of thousands of people seeing their stuff. And now it's showing that, you know, maybe only thousands have seen it. So it's dropped substantially. How do you manage that from a business perspective? What is it that you're doing to allow you to still make sure that the people in your community get to see you, hear you, and then have opportunities to work with you? Well, when it first came out, I wasn't a big fan of the add everyone tag for groups. And uh, after a little bit, I said, you know what, I'm going to be using it <laughs> until Mark Zuckerberg opens the floodgates to, you know, back 2016, 2017 Facebook group engagement levels. I'll use that everyone. Now, I don't use it every single day on just willy nilly, but I'm probably using it three or four times a week. And if someone has a problem with that, you know, they can leave the group. It's not the end of the world. I think it's really important with Facebook groups. Uh, members can sense fear. So if you're afraid to promote your own stuff in the group uh, or enforce rules, things like that, it's going to get out of hand or could get out of hand quickly. So I've always treated the group a little bit like a, I say dictator, <laughs> not in a bad way, but, you know, very tight with rules and things to make sure people get the best possible experience. Um, the other thing that I've done, which I recommend group owners do, is I've taken a, a collaborative approach, kind of expansive. I don't view it as, oh, this is my group and there's 26,000 people in here and only I can work with them. You know, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I can't help everyone. Uh, so people in the group have gotten business and they're kind of sheepish when they tell me, uh, like, oh, yeah, Mark, I got a couple of clients from your group last year. And I'm like, great. You know, you give good content. You do it the right way and you're answering posts and things like that. So I want you to be compensated for that. I love it. The very abundance minded in your approach. And so we really got a good understanding around the, you know, collaborative nature of the group and, you know, building the community. You mentioned before in, in our brief conversation around marketing and how to really stand out with your marketing. So I wonder if you have some tips or ideas to help business owners with that. So one of the things I noticed, I'm a big fan of email marketing. So I've done daily emails to my list now since 2016, like 3,000 and some days. My email marketing 
stunk for results before that. But the other thing I did besides emailing regularly every day is I took the filter off and I wasn't afraid of, oh, am I going to lose, you know, a person, put out some strong opinions and make them as entertaining as I can make them. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't do that with their marketing because like, well, I can't say this because I'm afraid I'm going to lose this person. And it could go a little too far sometimes in the politically charged times that we're in. You could very easily spend all day if you're posting political stuff, fighting with strangers on the internet. So you have to be careful how you use it. But I find that uh, entrepreneurs are just too timid and they're worried about offending people. I would rather lose some people but have some more raving fans as well, as opposed to being what I call in the mushy middle. If you're just putting out weak content, that's not going to ever offend anyone. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and 3,000 consecutive days of emails is phenomenal. Uh, I, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who know they need to do a nurture sequence and to get one post a month, you know, which would be a big win, but you know, daily is, is impressive. How have you found your audience response to that? You know, you mentioned, don't be afraid, you know, don't be in that, you know, the weak middle. Have you found that you know, people are okay with receiving that many emails from you? So any objection you or anyone who's watching this would have around daily emails, I assure you that I had the exact same <laughs> before I started them. So the person that got me into them, I thought he was crazy, but I was also ready to give up my email marketing uh, tool and just focus on what was working. I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. I'll do it for a month, you know, and put it out there. So yes, you will uh, chase away some people. I always warn coaches, entrepreneurs, when I'm getting them into daily emails, your early the early days of that new practice, you're going to see uh, higher unsubscribe totals than you would have normally see. It's because if people aren't used to hearing from you often, maybe you haven't emailed them in a few months, all of a sudden you, they're getting emailed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. they may forget they subscribed or forget who you are, but then it levels off, you know, after a while and people get into that rhythm. So I'm very clear when people opt into my list that it's daily emails. It's not hidden uh, anywhere. But the other thing I did, which I recommend that that email marketers do, is most email platforms have a setting that Kevin B's unsubscribes from my list. You can give feedback, you know, why, and I'll get an email. Uh, and so that's set up like a Weber is what I use. And I turn that setting off because I don't want to be like, let's say you unsubscribe. I get an email right away. Kevin B's is unsubscribed. And then I'm thinking, gee, what did I say in today's email <laughs> about Kevin? Like, was I insulting Australia? I don't think so. Now, what did I say? And then it's getting into real head game and messes with you. And you're going to be timid and afraid of anything that you put. So I recommend if you're not just daily emails, any email frequency that you're doing, that you turn that setting off, that you're not getting notified every time somebody leaves it's going to make it much easier to do this practice if you do wise very very wise counsel thank you so much in terms of how do you get that many emails done are you writing something every day or do you batch it and write things in advance I batch it. Yeah. Now that being said, I like keeping at least a week. Sometimes I'm two, three weeks ahead. But if something happens, let's say there's a, a zombie apocalypse tomorrow and I don't want to write about it in my email, I could just push the one that I had scheduled for tomorrow back and then insert one that's more around current events. So there's some flexibility there as well. But I'll sit down in one setting, I'll write a week's worth of emails and it's just peace of mind to stay ahead because life's going to get in the way too, right? And you don't want to be in a situation where if you get sick or you know whatever happens, a death of a loved one or something, you're not going to feel like sitting down and writing emails. And it's a lot of pressure too if you're writing them in the morning, let's say ready to go out, you're staring at a blank screen. Uh, I would not have been able to get to 3,000 plus days if I hadn't been batching them. Yeah, wow. Two important questions for you on this. When you sit down to batch and you write a whole week's worth, how long does it take? And typically, how long is each email? So full disclosure, I can cheat now. And what I mean by that is I could go back if there's an email that I sent five years ago and I can copy paste. I might have to tweak a little bit, you know, if there's something in there uh, needed, but I sometimes do that. If 
I'm like, okay, I wrote an email that was similar to this and it would make the point. So I don't do that all time, but I can go back and pull old ones. My emails are usually a couple hundred words. They're not long. The structure of the email is I want to give, I don't want to teach. I think a lot of email marketers like, I got to teach everything and dump all this stuff in there. And, and that's not what I'm suggesting. Um, I want to give an aha, a lesson, something that I think would help them. You know, maybe it's something I picked up in a book or I saw watching a movie or it's a story from my life, my clients' lives, keeping confidentiality in mind, et cetera. I'm giving them that aha uh -huh, or what I want them to know. And then I'm transitioning to a call to action, but it's not a real like arm twisty type one. I might be like, oh, by the way, I go over this in greater detail in module three of my XYZ program. Here's a link to check it out. You know, something like that. Awesome. And so you have a call to action daily, every day? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love it. So I'm not, a, I shouldn't say I'm not a fan of nurturing. I think you always want to nurture uh, relationships, but I actually heard some terrible advice once from an email guru who said, when someone joins your list, you don't make any offers for the first 50 days. You send them 50 days of emails. You know, that's your life story from kindergarten uh, all through school, you know, and up until the present day. And I think people are going on your list because they need help with something. And it's not good if you're not giving a solution. Uh, now, when I say that there's an, a call to action in every email, it could be, for example, Mondays when is when Natural Born Coaches, we release a new podcast episode. It could be a link to the new podcast episode. It doesn't mean that it's always an offer, but al almost all the time it is. And I don't bounce around day to day where today I'm doing offer A, tomorrow B, the day after C, then I go back to A or whatever. Usually I'm about a week at a time where I'm spending that week promoting whatever, you know, and that might switch the next week too like you really have to you don't want to be jumping around too much and you have to give enough time there for the offer to get through cut through the noise so i like the roughly speaking weekly window i love it it sounds so powerful and so clear and if we can sit down and write you know seven lots of 200 word emails it sounds like you might be able to bash that out in the morning or maybe mark yeah. your experience faster when I first started doing daily emails, it probably took an hour to do an email, right? Now it's like going to the gym, you build up your content creation muscle in this case. So I can write an email 10, 15 minutes with proofreading it, testing the link or whatever. It's not going to take as long. I usually start if I'm like, um, well, let's say if you and I were doing a joint venture, because I often promote joint ventures, I would get a blank piece of paper and I would just dump any ideas out there, brainstorm. Okay, what about Kevin's offer? What can I write emails about, whatever? And I might throw 15 ideas on that piece of paper, but we need seven for the email. Then I just start writing. And once you get going, it gets much easier. I find the toughest part is starting, <laughs> you know? And uh, what's the saying? A lot of times people think that you have to be motivated to take action. I think it's the opposite. I think that taking action then builds the motivation to keep going. I love that. Very clear. And since you spoke about habit stacking before, I'm going to share one of my, my favorite quotes on that, which was from James Clear. And I think he said the, uh, the hardest weight to push at the gym is the front door, right? So if we can get them to push that front door, then there's momentum, things are happening. So I, I really love that. Such a powerful uh, lesson and powerful insights. You mentioned about JVs. Tell us more about JVs. It sounds like you've had a lot of success with your business with doing joint ventures. So what are some things that we should be considering if we want to you know, leverage JVs in our business? So I do joint ventures differently the most. So pretty much everyone online does. I'll promote your uh, program, Kevin. You pay me 25% or 50% or whatever affiliate commission for every sale. Uh, the way I do it is a flat fee JV. And, you know, it's we could do a whole show on it. But in a nutshell, I charge a flat fee to the partner. They keep 100% of sales. And then I just promote the hack out of their stuff. Usually it's a weekly campaign, might end up being eight or nine days, but it's a minimum of seven days. So I get them on my podcast. I do daily emails to my list, wherever we're sending them to, if it's to register for a webinar or whatever. Daily social media, all over social media. We do three Facebook Lives. They get use of the Coaching Jungle wall, promote them there five times a day during the campaign if they want. And everything's directing where we want them to go with it. And it's worked really well because I find... A lot of people are doing lukewarm joint ventures 
And what's happening is where they're not sure if they're going to be compensated, they might be saying, oh, I'll send an email or two emails or do the odd post, which doesn't help the partner because it's just not enough to cut through the noise. Uh, so this works really well, fine for me and for the partner. And, you know, right now, as we're recording this, it's a $5,000 package. We had a, a promotion that's still going on where it's 4K. But yeah, I didn't start there. I think when I started, it was like 2000 you know, and then I moved it up accordingly every six months or a year or so. You don't have to do it that way. You could, if you want to do joint ventures with affiliate commissions and, you know, that's your choice. But I do like doing joint ventures because it gets... I mean, it gives me a chance to mix things up and not talk about myself 365 days here. Uh, so I'm like, oh, I got a week here to talk about Kevin and his offer and it keeps things fresh. Yeah, it keeps it very fresh. It's a week of content that, uh, you know, you can get help with as well. So that's that's wonderful. And, yeah, you know, you have a lot of value there because I know across your email and your social media, there's 100,000 followers. So if anyone had an audience of coaches, you know, and that's who they were targeting, this could be a very big ROI, uh, you know, for them. If anyone's listening wants to check it out, full disclosure, I pay uh, affiliate or sorry, referral uh, fees for it. So I'll pay you, Kevin, um, if they do, <laughs> but it's j jvwithmark.com. It's Mark with a C. And please let me know that you heard about it on this show. So I know Kevin uh, is a source for it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, that's very kind. Uh, what a what a wonderful bonus. If you do do it, then uh, yeah, yeah, let Mark know that'd be great. Uh, I would just love for you to have success. If there's any way, uh, you know, listen to the show, got you connected to that that uh, audience and that community and the awesomeness of Mark, that would be brilliant. And so uh, wherever you're listening, click in the show notes because there's a clickable link there to jvwithmark.com. And additionally, the um, you know, the other areas that we've spoken about the coaching jungle.com and uh, my my jungle vip.com so yeah click in the show notes and, and click those now mark we talk about life-changing questions on the show we say that the quality of the questions we ask ourselves impacts the quality of the life that we lead with that being true what's one question you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or the life of the clients that you serve well, it's a question I actually asked myself today when I was journaling. <laughs> so I have to remind myself, am I having fun doing this? You know, there's so many things with your business that you could be doing. And we often automatically just do it because we think we have to. Um, I'm making a real effort. I just passed the 10 year mark for my online business that I want to, for the most part, do stuff I enjoy doing. There's always going to be stuff that's like, oh, OK, maybe it's not the most fun, but I don't want to be doing the stuff I hate or that I'm not good at. So, yeah, ask yourself is this, you know, are you having fun doing this? Because if you're not having fun with whatever task, you're not going to stay consistent with it. Um, the reason I've been able to do so many podcasts, daily emails, joint ventures, et cetera, is because I enjoy it. So it makes it easier. Am I having fun doing this? Um, have there been periods of time where you've maybe forgotten to ask that question or periods of time where the answer for too long has been no? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there's been times, uh, the, the challenge with the online space, I guess, building any business, but especially online is you need to have horse blinders on because people will be, you know, trying to grab you from every which direction telling you, you have to be doing this, you have to be doing that. So for example, the last few years, I dodged, I say a couple bullets, uh, because people first were telling me a few years ago that you have to be on Clubhouse. Oh my God, Clubhouse, it's the next big thing. It's amazing or whatever. And I knew all these coaches and entrepreneurs that were spending 80 hours a day on Clubhouse. And I'm like, no, I, it's not my thing. I checked it out and I don't enjoy it. So I'm just not going to do it. Well, Clubhouse for the most part is dead or on life support now. Uh, same goes last summer with threads. You know, I wrote, oh, you gotta be on threads, you know, and all these grown adults. Oh, it's so fun. I get to dunk on Elon Musk on threads. It's ha ah, or whatever. I'm like, okay, is that helping your business? I said, nope, I've never even started with threads. I just had no interest whatsoever. Uh, so those things wouldn't have been fun for me and they just would have been a distraction. But I have to remind myself because sometimes I'm tempted where I'm like, oh, gee, you know, this, you know, sounds interesting. Maybe I should check it out some more. And you only have 24 hours a day. So you got to be careful. I love it. Stick those blinders on. That's so, so important. 
yeah, really yeah, get honed in. And Clubhouse, it came and went. Threads, I see Facebook actually promoting it quite a bit. They're not letting it go. I think they really, they really want it to work. I see stuff in my yes. feed, and I'm like, that looks interesting. And then you go to click on it. It's like, oh, no, you've got to go across the threads. It's the threads. Thread. And I'm like, no, I okay. don't know if they changed it, too. I think they tied it into your Instagram account so that once you start it, you can't delete it without deleting your Instagram because they want to keep their numbers up for users. So I just would rather not even get started. But I am on X, you know, and um, so or Twitter. I still call Twitter a lot. Um, <laughs> and I get my fixes of stuff there, but I don't spend a ton of time there either. Yeah, same, same, same. I don't really post anything in Twitter. It's just a place I can go and uh, take a look at things. And uh, I'm not a big Instagram user, so uh, so not threads either. But I love this whole thing about having blinders on and not being pulled into something else. If you have a strategy, you know, keep your head down, keep working at it. And... Uh, make sure you're having fun doing it because if you're not having fun, like what's what's the point? I really love that message. It's such an important one. And we can forget. I'm sure if I go back through and audit what I'm doing in my day, there are certain things that I do. And the answer to that question would be no, this, is, this isn't fun. You know, dealing with all of the emails, no, no thanks, that's not fun. You know, any of the bookkeeping, no thanks, that's not fun. So, well, actually, I'm an accountant, so the bookkeeping for me is fun, but probably for the listeners, yeah. <laughs> it probably, probably won't be. So uh, what are those things that we say, hey, when it's not fun, you can change what you're doing. Um, presumably, Mark, you can probably outsource some of these things as well because, you know, some of these things yeah. are important. We have to get them done even if you don't enjoy doing them. Yeah, like I have um, helped with the coaching jungle with admin. You know, I just actually brought a new person on board two weeks ago. She's in South Africa and she's doing a great job. But I could very easily spend my whole day in the coaching jungle, right? And I like being in there, see what's going on, but I have to force myself to – pull back, you know, and, and let them do their jobs, you know, with the admin and uh, not be trying to shut my hands in everything uh, there as well. So yeah, you can outsource everything. I think the mistake that people make is they think, let's say VAs, for example, virtual assistants, that they have to start with 40 hours a week getting help. You can get started with a couple hours a week, hire someone, see how they're working out. Then you can expand their responsibilities as time goes on. You don't have to bite off, of, you know, more than you could chew right off the bat you can start small and then bump it up as you go along exactly exactly uh having freelancers you know we live in a gig economy now so there's many websites you can go and do that go and check out upwork.com onlinejobs.ph.com you get people to do specific tasks fiverr another good one so i know there's a lot of things that i get down there and uh sarah jane the podcast editor will be listening to this you know i'm very thankful in 200 nearly 250 episodes now i've not had to e edit one of those because she does an amazing yeah. job i wouldn't want to go near doing that it's uh something that's not in my skill set and would i be having fun doing that no way i have this is fun i enjoy doing this piece so hey mark you shared so much value and so much wisdom as we look towards the future you, you've accomplished so much with your business so far you're helping a lot of coaches you know improve their businesses and live a great life if we go a decade into the future are there some things that you still have on your bucket list some things that you still want to accomplish well, the big um, elephant in the room for me is I want to get not just one book, but many books written. I have, I say, I don't consider it a real book. I have a book in the Kindle store. What was supposed to be a PDF lead magnet that just ballooned and then, you know, got bigger than I thought, but I don't consider that my book. So that is uh, my goal uh, with it. And uh, I want to be writing a lot more books. So nothing against daily emails. I, I'm going to continue uh, that and content creation, but there's something about books where it's so, uh, well, if you look at the, uh, some of the books in my bookcase, like think and grow rich and stuff from the 1930s, it's still on bookcases <laughs> even today, you know, almost a hundred years later. So it's more lasting than with social media. It's almost like writing something in the sand, the water comes and washes it away. It's not as long lasting there. Beautiful. Do you know what topics you want to write on? You know, obviously I'm in the coaching world. Uh, so that's something like for coaches, what I don't want to do and not to throw shade at people who've written books in the coaching world. I don't want a, um, dry, you know, textbook -y, if that's a word, uh, type book. There's enough of that. Uh, so I read a lot of books for coaches and around online entrepreneurship. And uh, there's a lot of just stuff that will put you to sleep. So I want to have fun with it. You know, my sense of humor can be dry, uh, a little bit sarcastic, stuff like that. I also want to challenge people. One of my favorite, I say favorite movies, at least entrepreneurship wise, is uh, Bullworth. If you see now on Warren Beatty from back mm -hmm. in the 90s, 
he's running for president and uh, he's a, a senator uh, who's depressed with his life and he orders a hit on himself uh, so his family can get the life insurance because he can't commit suicide or they don't get it. So he's running in his reelection campaign. And since he knows an assassin's going to kill him during the campaign, he's like, well, I might as well just speak the truth, right? Very um, unlike most politicians. So he just takes a filter off and, and just throws it all out there because he's going to die. Well, he starts getting really popular <laughs> and it like, it really hits and connects with people. Cause Oh my God, it's a politician who's actually, you know, not speaking like a typical politician. There's actually shades of Trump in there. If you look at it, where I think that Trump has a lot of supporters is that he isn't, you know, speaking like the media trained politicians are. And I would like to do that with a book uh, where you don't hold back and you t tell people what you think they need to hear uh, without any reservation. So that that's the plan, but could go from coaches to more of a general entrepreneur focus as well. Love it. What a uh, really great goal. And that's a, a great metaphor and uh, story. I've never seen that movie, but uh, I think it's great. So is it Bullworth? Speak the truth, filter off and see what happens. That's amazing. Yeah, Mark, I, uh, I know it's getting very late for you there. You've stayed up late for us uh, in Canada to make sure you could be on this call. So uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I just one final question for you. Are there any, any final messages you'd like to share with uh, the listeners today? I would, from what we talked about, challenge people to not sleep on daily emails or don't dismiss it out of hand and just give yourself a month. Don't put the pressure on. If I told myself in the early days, I'm going to be writing 3,000 and some days of emails, that would have freaked me out. And so journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Challenge yourself and say, I'm going to take one month to do daily emails. And if you don't like it at the end of the month, you don't have to keep doing it. But I think a lot of people will be surprised uh, once they get going with it. So I would challenge them to start daily emails. Love it journey your journey of 3000 emails started with one email so uh, yeah get get started i like it i i like your challenge i'm going to take your challenge um i may take a little bit of september to get up to speed <laughs> and start going in october yeah it, that helps and, and i'll leave you with a tip too if people say well i don't like writing so i'm not going to do email well let's say you're more of a video person your emails could be uh let's say um one sentence or two sentences. If you're a health coach, um, hey, <clears throat> I um, did a Facebook Live in my Facebook group yesterday showing how you can lose 10 pounds in the next month while not uh, getting rid of your favorite foods. Here's a link to give it a watch, you know, something like that. So it could just be one or two sentences. You don't have to focus on the written word. If you're more video, you could send them that way. But just an idea. Love it. Great idea. Great challenge. And thank you so much for it. And just as a quick recap on the call today, then put, put those blinders on. Don't get distracted by things that are going to take you off. Of course, stay focused on what you're doing and keep going. You know, whatever challenges you're facing, you know, if you want to get to the 3000 emails, the 25,000 members, the 900 podcast interviews is keep going, keep pushing forwards. And one key piece in there then is ask yourself, am I having fun doing this? If you're not get help with the bits and pieces that you don't want to do or change what you're doing. So am I having fun with this? So Mark, thank you so much. It's been really fantastic today. I really appreciate your time and your energy. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. Thanks so much for listening to the Life Changing Questions podcast with your host, Kevin Bees. We'll catch you next time.